Yeah, fuck it. Why not, right? Why not? So I am. I got to Yeah, okay, that's off. Okay. I am reading Theory Underground. No, not Theory Underground. I'm reading Time Energy. Dave's book. Um, reading the second edition with the forward by Zizek himself. Um, or Audible. What's up? Here, let's do this. Um, oh, that's why. Okay, better. This theme song goes hard, huh? Made this fucking around on, uh... I don't even know what it was. I was fucking around. Anyway. What's happening, everybody? Bing bong. I am recording the Time Energy audiobook. And uh, I thought, I don't know, maybe I'll make a little video out of it. Probably won't, uh, you know, like, do anything with it. But maybe it'll be part of something. Maybe it'll be like a special feature of something. Um, so... We are going to enter the Twilight Zone. I am re-recording stuff. I, uh, I've been messing around, man, trying to get my shit dialed in. I'm just not happy with my audio. So I've, I'm trying some, some different things on this one. So I'm re-recording -re parts that I already have recorded. Um, I don't know. So we're going to see. Um... So I'm going to just go ahead and jump into it, okay? This is chapter three. I am recording over here on Audacity, which you can't really see. There it is. There's Audacity. You can't really see it. This is the book. There's Audacity. Um... And the audacity is actually going to be separate from the OBS recording. But we're going to, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, try and just try new shit. You know what I'm saying? Anyway. Here we go. Let's do this. And yes, I'm way up on it because that is how you get the best audio. You know what I'm saying, my dog, my dude? You know what I'm saying, saying, saying. Okay, ready to go. Yep. Chapter 3. Humanistically Qualified Life versus Social Darwinism. Those who buy into the narrative of sucks to suck, find a way to make yourself useful, or get out of the way for those who do, miss the fact that ours is a reality in which one can work hard for an entire lifetime without ever getting ahead and that those who are considered successful are usually an extreme minority of people whose consumption and production habits, addictions, and neuroses simply happened by luck of the draw to select them as opposed to others as exemplars. Lucky winners, considering the fact that millions of others are doing similarly yet achieving different results. If the social Darwinist attitude of well, it's just survival of the fittest, and our society is selecting for innovators and reliable workers, not hippies who have nothing of serious value to add to the lives of others, is what we are calling the self-proclaimed realist position, then the position triggered in reaction to this is usually what we would call humanist. The humanist response can take different routes, basing its arguments on the inherent value of every human or how we are... <laughs> Fuck. Okay, I'm gonna 
we're going to hear this back and we're going to see what's happening. The humanist response can take different routes, basing its arguments on the inherent. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck that up, dog. You fucked it all up, dog. The humanist response can take different routes, basing its arguments on the inherent value of every human or how we either are equal or ought to be treated as equals. Though these all get at something important, these beliefs are based in reaction to and lack of understanding in what is meant by human. There is a less discussed but more important understanding that sees all humans as beings whose lives are irreplaceable, meant to be, and more importantly, virtually purposive. To really understand this position, much less why it is my own, we'll take the rest of this book to unpack. Appeals to religious or other faith-based principles need not be made to argue that our lives are irreplaceable and meant to be. We simply point out that meaning is itself dependent on being, that the sense of being is dependent on humans, and that each human has a life that can be compared, but that is, in its actuality, wholly irreducible to others. Okay, so I'm going to pause, go back and reread that to make sure I got the meaning and that I read it properly. I don't know. Appeals to religious, or actually, let's just listen. Let's listen while we look. You know what I'm saying? That the sense of being is dependent on humans, and that each human has a life that can... No, let's go back here. Appeals to religious or other faith-based principles need not be made to argue that our lives are irreplaceable and meant to be. We simply point out that meaning yep. is itself... Where was that? Appeals to religious or other faith-based principles that our lives are irreplaceable and meant to be. We simply point... Okay. <clears throat> we need simply point out that meaning is itself dependent on being, that the sense of being is dependent on humans, and that each human has a life that can be compared but that is, in its actuality, wholly irreducible to others. More important, though, is the virtually purposive aspect of what it means to be human. Let's listen back to that again. That the sense of being is dependent on humans, and that each human has a life that can be compared, but that is, in its actuality, wholly irreducible to others. More important, though, is the virtually purposive aspect of what it means to be human. Dude, my audio is fucking still not where I want it, dude. I'm angry, man. Let's turn this light on back here. Oh, shit. I'm, I'm sure that fucked up the OBS audio. I don't give a shit. Fuck OBS, dude. Not really. You know what I'm saying? I am recording a video for some fucking reason. I don't know why, dude. I don't know why, dude. Whatever, dude. Okay, yeah, my audio still sucks. Fucking still sucks, dude. More important, though, is the virtually purposive aspect of what it means to be human. Okay. Virtually purposive means that the human is not just what it is, it is also what it can be. When one takes the life of another, they are not just taking what was, but also what could have been. Human beings are the virtually purpose of animal, meaning we are not where we are, we are not reducible to how we appear or what we have done and, in a sense, can only be judged after we have met our end. That can be is not always a must be, but to know what one must do, one must first experiment with what can be done. You cannot know what you might, much less must, become if not for the freedom to exercise abilities, discover latent talents, experiment with diverse skill sets in different contexts, and develop yourself in reference to and for others who have similarly had the sustained freedom of time energy plus the resources to explore their interests. That used to be what school meant, which was an end in itself, not just a means toward getting a job. Where are the footnotes? So... Actually, dude, I might just kind of live, live stream this, because um, I think it's interesting. 
Love this book. Um, so for footnotes, anybody who might be watching this might notice how I'm treating footnotes, might have questions. I had questions, you know, the question of how to handle footnotes when recording an audiobook. Um, and there are, I don't think, any, you know, absolute answers. I have seen it done multiple ways. And for this text, trying to find the footnote here in the book, um, so I can mark it so I know what I'm doing. Um, I've seen multiple ways to handle it for this text. I figured the best way to handle it was just to, for the most part, read the footnotes in line with the main body of text. And the reason for that is because these footnotes, for the most part, are largely small additions or clarification. Now, if any of you have seen Dave and I reading Capital on Capital Mondays, MCM versus CMC Prime, or MCM Prime versus CMC Prime, MCM Prime versus CMC T Cubed, Capital Mondays, whatever, um, you will have seen the huge footnotes that marks and angles use marks but also angles huge gigantic footnotes you know i mean there's some pages where the entire page itself almost the entire page itself is a fucking footnote like like these two pages for instance pages 174 and 175 in the penguin edition almost the entire page is footnotes like that, all this is footnote. This tiny little fragment is the text, the main text. Same thing on this page. This tiny fragment is the main text. All of this is footnote. Um, that is not how time energy is written. They are, for the most part, small additions, small clarifications, and they flow in line with the main text. So the way I'm doing it is I'm just reading them as if they're parenthet parenthetical in the main text itself for the most part um i don't know if i will do that for the entire book and maybe i'll change it even in the afterward um because the afterward um dave has some different usage of footnotes here in the main text his footnotes are like clarifications like in chapter two he talks about depressive hedonia um, and he does define it in the main text, but then he says it's just a little, almost like a little flourish. He's like depressive itself is straightforward. Hedonia means seeking pleasure. Like that was the footnote. So just a little seasoning on the steak that is the main text. Um, so that, that's how Dave uses them in the book. And then in the afterward, he uses them like uh, citations, almost. I don't know, dude. I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know if citation is the right word. Um, well, and here he does, too. I shot myself in the foot. Here in footnote 11 in chapter 3, it just says, Giorgio Agamben, homo soccer. So that is Dave talking about something Agamben is saying, and then he's just putting, you know, for further reading on that, look up Homo Soccer. And then also footnote 12, similarly, on our rent, the human condition. Um, but I'm marking the footnotes here in the text just so I have them. I've been going back and forth between reading PDF, reading text, um, or the, the physical book itself. So I like to have, just have them highlighted so I have some visual cues. It's a little bit easier. I am labeling them differently in Audacity um, in case we want to do something different. So they're actually separate selections in the main recording, and they are labeled. So if we needed to, we could go back into my files, move them around. I do not say footnote whatever, um, which some people do in audiobooks. Um, I just read them like they're part of the text, but yeah, there's, there's multiple ways to handle footnotes in 
In audiobooks, you can ignore them completely. You can publish them separately. I think it might have been Foster Wallace, David Foster Wallace, who uh, published the footnotes as a, like a separate, a separate audiobook itself. Um, or you can read the text and then say footnote nine, blah, blah, blah. And then go back to the text. I mean, there's different ways to handle it. This is how I'm doing it for time energy. Um, don't know how I will do it for every other book. I'm hoping I uh, never have to do an audiobook of Capital because I don't know how I would handle those footnotes. I will never have to do an audiobook of Capital. Um, I mean, yeah, never have to. Definitely would want to. Maybe I will. Maybe someday I will. You know, do a LibriVox for Capital. I don't know. But we're getting back to the text. Okay, we stopped here at Schooling versus Scole. We're going to continue. Schooling versus Scole. Shit. Hold on. Hold on. Which was an end in itself, not just a means toward getting a job. That sounded bad, dude. I don't like my voice. Schooling versus skole. The word school traces back to ancient Greece, with additional influence in the ways Romans appropriated the Greek term skole. The general way of interpreting this is as leisure. Though the Merriam-Webster Dictionary entry for school is interesting and shares the word's history, some very important context is left out of what this word means and has meant now for thousands of years to people who are considered history's greatest minds. Leisure means something different to people now, which is why Merriam-Webster's dictionary says students will likely be surprised by the literal translation. The word school referring to a place of learning traces back to Greek skole, which has a meaning that will surprise students. Leisure. The leap from leisure to learning is not as great as one might first think. To the Greeks, leisure allowed a man to spend time thinking and finding out about things. Hence, the connection between leisure and the pursuit of knowledge, and eventually to a place of learning. Okay, so I stopped that recording. Gonna go down here. I'm gonna look and see. That's not even worth reading. Because he does say, this is the Merriam-Webster. Oh, shit. Undo, bitch. You can't control Z in uh, Edge for PDFs. That's interesting, you know? So, yeah, that's, that's unnecessary. Um, these are all unnecessary. I might even say, Ibid. I won't say Ibid. I might say, um, let's do an example here. Shit, where was I? Hold on. I was at the end of, okay, I was at the end of that. So for this one here, I might say, for the Greeks, economics pointed to a private sphere of life that was literally at odds with political life and freedom. I might say Hannah Arendt and the human condition tells us that for the Greeks, economics pointed to a private sphere of life that was literally at odds with political life and freedom. The founding fathers of the United States took this to be true and in that sense were not like capitalists of our day. I might do that. Or might not. I don't know. We'll see. Hannah Arendt tells us, in the human condition, that for the Greeks, economics pointed to a private sphere of life that was literally at odds with political life and freedom. <clears throat> for Giorgio Agamben, in his Homo Soccer, this is the distinction between bare life and the politically qualified life, which is in part a notion he owes to Hannah Arendt. So I might say... 
G- uh, Giorgio Agamben in Homo Soccer posits that this is the distinction between bear life and the politically qualified life, which is in part a notion he owes to Hannah Arendt. I mean that, right? Giorgio Agamben in Homo Soccer posits that this is the distinction between bear life and the politically qualified life, which is in part a notion he owes to Hannah Arendt. I mean, I might do that. What do you think? By the time anyone sees this, if they ever do, it will have been done. <laughs> but this is the process, you know what I'm saying, dog? Um, for rent, this is the distinction between a life spent in labor versus the vita activa, which is the kind of political action one takes in the public sphere when equal meaning, equality, blah, 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 and argue and collectively decide their fate. Yeah, I won't. I won't say that one. Um, when it's just a citation like that, it's not. It's not needed to like interject into the written into the text. You know. Um, when it is like actual content, when it content bearing footnotes um then it is worth reading those so where was the last one this depressive hedonia right so up here the way we cope is through depressive hedonia which means keeping ourselves distracted from disappointment and depression through pleasure seeking consumption that does not feel fulfilling and then the footnote goes the term is from mark fisher's capitalist realism depressive is obvious but Hedonia means pleasure seeking. That's content, you know? I wouldn't put it. Uh, Dave is kind of footnote happy. He's definitely not as footnote happy as some other people, but um I mean, is that how it's done? Maybe. I uh, I think footnotes are gay. <laughs> For the most part. Having footnotes like scattered about all over the place. I think that's fucking gay, dude. I think it's stupid. Um, what do I know? I'm not a fancy, uh, smart writer person. I'm just some dickhead. Footnotes are fucking gay, dude. <laughs> I'm funny. <laughs> okay. Just double check, make sure. And eventually to a place of learning. Okay. God, my voice sucks, dude. I hate it. Merriam Webster admits that the root of school being leisure will surprise students today because leisure and learning do not seem related now. But it actually does make sense because for the Greeks, leisure led to thinking and research, thus, learning. This is not incorrect, but misses the most important context. In other words, the conceptual system within which these words took on their signification. Leisure as opposed to slavery. In... This is Ready Player One. Uh, is it Ludus? Is that the... Is that the planet where the schools are? Ludo Ludo play. Ludus. I don't, I think it was. I think it was Ludus. It was either Ludus or another. Thing where what's his name? Ernie Klein thought he was being clever and tying play and, and school because that planet Ludus uh, that's where all the schools were, and the main character was poor and broke and couldn't leave the planet with the school or some something like that. There, Ernest Klein, the author of Ready Player One, plays around with this uh, commingling of learning and playing in Ready Player One. And it's not like Ernie Klein's a great writer. He's, I mean, he's good. He's de- he is a good writer. Like nobody can say he's not a good writer. He's made you know, shitload of money on his books and he has a movie and I mean, they're not great, but they're well, they're done well enough to pass for a Steven fucking Spielberg movie. Isn't that crazy, dude? Steven fucking Spielberg made his movie. It's fucking crazy. And the movie sucked. The book was better because I'm gay like that. Oh, I'm so smart because I read books. I read lots of books. Look how fucking smart I am. You're stupid. You watch movies. Oh, I'm so smart. I'm smarter than you. (sighs) 
Okie dokie, artichokey. <laughs> the Western concept of leisure cannot be understood without an understanding of slavery. Today, slavery is so taboo and considered such a shameful part of our history that people are averse to thinking or talking about it. But we cannot know the nature of freedom without thinking of it in relation to unfreedom. Slavery was considered the condition of leisure. So what was slavery to a free man of... Ah, oh, fuck. Slavery was considered the condition of leisure. So what was slavery to a free man of... Ah. Oh. I should move this so, so you can see the whole thing. So, what was slavery to a free man of Athens? Fussing about economic necessity and not having a final say in one's own desire or involvement with others was considered slavery. I didn't read that right. The condition of leisure. So, what was slavery to a free man of Athens? Fussing about economic necessity and not having final say in one's own desire or involvement with others was considered slavery. Likewise, losing control over one's instinctive appetites, be they sexual, food, etc., or constantly caring about the opinions of everyone else were also signs of a slavish character because self-control was absent. Self-control, therefore, meant freedom. But freedom, more generally defined, was freedom from economic necessity. So what is economic necessity, and how does it undermine freedom by making slaves of us all? I fucking hate my voice, dude. Let's hear that again. Let's see how fucking gay that sounds. Play, bitch. So what is economic necessity, and how does it undermine freedom by making slaves of us all? Yeah, I can't. I can't abide that. That sounds... That, that, oh, uh, I'm so cool. Look how fucking cool I am. Uh, uh, uh. So what is economic necessity, and how does it undermine freedom by making slaves of us all? Fucking gay, dude. So, what is economic necessity, and how does it un- First time was better, I should have just kept the first reading. Now I'm gonna do this dumb bullshit. So, what is economic necessity, and how does it undermine freedom by making slaves of us all? Economic necessity and essential labor. If we do not feel rested, we will not be able to focus on anything really more complicated. Uh, fuck! Fucking Dave. Economic <sighs> necessity and... That was gross. I just... I just swallowed a bunch of loogie. Economic necessity and essential labor. If we do not feel rested, we will not be able to focus on anything really more complicated than what is necessary to find a place to rest our heads. Hunger is likewise a condition that undermines critical, rigorous, and sustained inquiry, study, or the kind of focus necessary to discover, invent, or create. In other words, there are basic requirements that must be met before one can really do anything else, especially if you, like the overwhelming majority of people who have lived, get the urge to raise a family. Doing so means you will need to make yourself a suitable partner and then provide for offspring. Hannah Arendt in The Human Condition tells us that, for the Greeks, economics pointed to a private sphere of life that was literally at odds with political life and freedom. The founding fathers of the United States took this to be true and, in that sense, were not like capitalists of our day. This ancient sense for the word economics had to do with managing one's private affairs to the point of having it all in order. One's wife... Children and slaves were running the farm, preparing meals, and worrying about how to distribute scarce resources. Production, consumption, exchange, and distribution were not socialized, much less considered a political issue. 
fact, it was quite the opposite. To be a free man of Athens required not just having subjugated others who minded to one's necessary affairs, but more importantly, it meant that the socially necessary labor of society was being tended to by those who were considered unfree. To concern oneself with turning a profit, much less with stressing about basic necessities of survival, was to be lowered to the status of a slave. Slavery in ancient societies was not the highly commercialized and radicalized version of colonial American society. Prior to the founding of the United States and the transatlantic slave trade, slavery was different. Slavery was considered what you get if, upon losing a way, you did not have the self-respect to take your own life. In such times, a free man is a warrior who refuses to work for others, instead forcing the losers to work for him. In such a worldview, a society that insists we all do necessary labor would be a society that wants us all to be slaves. A society that ensures we all have time energy, on the other hand, would be a society wherein the conditions of freedom have been guaranteed for all. Merriam-Webster conflates the kind of education that qualifies one's time energy on call for the market as labor power with the kind of education that qualifies one's life as a human free of economic necessity. I have an idea. I'm going to... Uh, pronounce? I'm going to have this motherfucker pronounce this shit for me. Pronunciations. On uh, homo soccer, I think they're pronounced. On uh, Giorgio Ogamben's book, Homo Saker. Um, I think the correct pronunci pronunciation of Homo Saker is actually Homo Sacher, uh, but I find that harder to say, so I'm going to stick with the pronunciation as Homo Saker, which I've heard other people say. How you say this shit in Latin, bitch? Sacher. Sacher. We're saying Sacher, motherfucker. Get in the truck. We're doing crimes. Kidoki. As labor power with the kind of education that qualifies one's life as a human free of economic necessity. In Homo Sacher, in Homo Sacher, Giorgio Agamben posits that this is the distinction between bare life and the politically qualified life. No, we're not doing that. Posits? No. In Homo Sacher, Giorgio Agamben posits that this is the distinction between bare life and tells the politically us. qualified life. No, we're not. We're going to say tells us. Um, Giorgio Agamben tells us in Homo Sacher that this is the distinction between bare life and the politically qualified life. Giorgio Agamben tells us in Homo Sacher that this is the distinction. Let me hear you say it again, Google. Sacher. 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 Okay. Uh, Giorgio Agamben tells us in Homo Sacher that this is the distinction between bare life Giorgio Agamben tells us in Homo Sacher that this is the distinction. Shows us, maybe? Tells us. For Giorgio Agamben. Giorgio Agamben says in Homo Sacher that this... Eh, we'll just say says, dude. Why not, brother? Why not, brother? Giorgio Agamben says in Homo Sacher that this is the distinction between bare life and the politically qualified life, which is in part a notion he owes to honor a rent. For rent, this is the distinction between a life spent in labor versus A, the vita activa, which is the kind of political action one takes in the public sphere when equal, meaning equally free from necessity, men can meet to argue and collectively decide their fate. Fucking, what are you doing, Dave? Men 
can meet to argue like, this and is very clearly fucking like bang the fuck which out. is the kind of political action one takes in the public sphere when equal meaning equally free from necessity yeah like this is very clearly written fast a the vita activa like what is this a what is the fucking a dude what is the fucking a dude what is the fucking a dude what is the a dude for rent this is the distinction what is the a dude I think, I, think I, I think I've been going too long today. I think I need to, to do something else. I'm starting to get delirious. Starting to get delirious, dude. Okay, what am I saying here? Giorgio Agamben says in Homo Sacer that this is the distinction between bare life and the politically qualified life, which is in part a notion he owes to Honor Arendt. What was that sound? Giorgio Agamben says, Oh, is somebody here? Door Maybe I'm hallucinating. 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 Maybe not. Maybe there's a good, good ghost in my house. Maybe someone came on and just like didn't want to say what's up. Actually, if someone did show up, then they were being respectful of me recording because it's hard to, it's hard to record in a shitty little house with other people. Um, like my fucking, the door to my office doesn't shut all the way. And I have loud dogs, and there's just, like, it's hard. It's not soundproofed. It's, it's not set up to be a recording studio. It's a shitty house. So they were actually being respectful. They were being respectful. I could do ASMR, dude. Imagine I am tickling the inside of your ear with a pinky finger. Close your eyes. And put your pinky finger inside your ear. Curl it around. It'll be cool, dude. Trust me. Oh, Jesus. Okay, dude. But yeah, this is this is very clearly written quickly. It's punk rock. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I like it. But right now, I guess I I guess I probably just need a break because like my brain can't handle it right now you know what i'm saying but i do want to finish this chapter it's a short chapter all these chapters are short this book is is written in a way to be as accessible as possible and a huge part of that is length you know people see a book this big and they're like fuck that i'm not reading that and then they see a book this big and they're like, oh, shit, dude, I could actually do that. So accessibility, speed, the speed, at, the speed at which you can read the book matters. But also the speed at which this book was written is also an innovation. Most people don't be banging shit out like that you know, over a couple days, um, or whatever, who knows, man, probably most people do probably anyway, most people suck, which is in part a notion he owes to honor a rent. Oh, that's right. There was a, like a noise that this is the distinction between bare life and the politically qualified life, 
which is in part a notion he owes to honor a rent. I, I can clean that up or leave it in. Doesn't matter. For a rent, this is the distinction between a life spent in labor versus the vita activa, which is the kind of political action one takes in the public sphere when equal, meaning equally free from necessity, men can meet to argue and collectively decide their fate. Learning is not just what happens when you give leisure time to the people who do not have time to think, fuck you. I'm going to re-record that. Which is in part a notion he owes to honor a rent. Did I say the human condition earlier? As Arendt explains in The Human Condition, this is the distinction between a life spent in labor versus the vita activa. Yeah. According, Arendt says in The Human Condition that Arendt says in The Human Condition that this is the distinction. That, yeah, we'll do that. Fuck it. Why not, homie? Why not, homie? Which is in part a notion he owes to honor Arendt. In the human condition, Arendt says, aha. In the human condition, Arendt says that this is the distinction between a life spent in labor versus the vita activa, which is the kind of political action one takes in the public sphere when equal, meaning equally free from necessity, men can meet to argue and collectively decide their fate. Learning is not just what happens when you give leisure time to people who do not have time to think in terms of economic. In the human condition, Arendt says that this is the distinction between a life spent in labor versus the vita activa, which is the kind of political action one takes in the public sphere when equal, meaning equally free from necessity, men can meet to argue and collectively decide their fate. Learning is not just what happened. <clears throat> learning is not just what happens when you give leisure time to people who do not have time to think in terms of economic necessity. Within the last 200 years, learning took on the new meaning of preparing oneself for the labor market. Learning is now, for most people, about preparing us to cope with the terms of economic necessity. This means the fracturing of our time from its energy via the conversion of those into dicks on your forehead. This means the fracturing of our... Yeah, I'm just going to record that whole line. This means the fracturing of our time from its energy via the conversion of these into labor power. Rather than conquering economic necessity itself... The leisure basis of school itself is thus compromised and we become slavish. Whether we do poorly or well in school, we are all made losers compared to those free men of Athens, much less to our founding fathers. Okay, we're going to listen. This means... Yeah, I'm going to go back to the beginning. Chapter 3. Humanistically Qualified Life versus Social Darwinism. Those who buy into the narrative of sucks to suck, find a way to make yourself useful or get out of the way for those who do, miss the fact that ours is a reality in which one can work hard for an entire lifetime without ever getting ahead, and that those who are considered successful are usually an extreme minority of people whose consumption and production habits, addictions, and neuroses simply happened by luck of the draw to select them as opposed to others as exemplars. Lucky winners. Life versus social Darwinism. 
Those who buy into the narrative of sucks to suck, find a way to make yourself useful or get out of the way for those who do, miss the fact that everybody wanted to just make a life for an entire lifetime without ever getting ahead. And that those who are considered successful are usually an extreme minority of people whose consumption and production habits, addictions, and roses simply happened by luck of the draw to select them as opposed to others as exemplars. Lucky winners, considering the fact that millions of others are doing similarly yet achieving different results. If the social Darwinist attitude of, well, it This is sick as fuck, dude. <laughs> this shit's dope. Okay. Fuck. Okay, go back to one, not, not one, point one, one point oh. Shit, now I'm fucked, dude. No, not seven three, not one three, not one point oh three. One, just straight up one, dude. One, motherfucker. One, dude. One, dude. One. One. Okay, better dude. Chapter three. Okay. Okay, so I'm at the point now where I don't want to uh, just listen to this on the video. Again, we just read it. Um, and also, like, I'm not trying to give away Dave's, Dave's book. Um, like, while I'm reading, while I'm reading it, um, there's actually a process and, you know, I stop and I burp and I fart and I talk shit and I ask stupid questions. Um, and it's like a process, right? It's like I'm doing something, but then if we're just going to go back and like, listen to it, um, then I would just be giving away the marmalade for free. And I'm not trying to do that. Um, if there's anyone out there who hasn't read time energy, um, you can go buy it right now at theoryunderground.com or amazon.com. Um, and if you want to read it, but don't really have time to read books or are actually like a fan of audiobooks or even podcasts or whatever, and you use audible, this will be on articles audible soon. Um, and that'll be cool. I, I like to read books. I also listen to books. Um, kind of just depending on what I'm doing. And honestly, I usually, before I read a new book, I usually listen to it first. I'll speed it up so I can get through it faster. Um, and it does multiple things. First of all, if it's just trash and not worth listening to at all, I... Uh, I die. Stop. Like if it's just total garbage, like I've done that with some books where it's like, yeah, this is just total garbage. It's not worth even finishing. Uh, it's, but look, I don't do that all the time. It's actually really rare that I don't finish a book once I've started it, but listening to it at like two X or 2.2 or 2.4 X, depending on some people, um, you can, you can really speed them up. Other people, you can't like, there's some that, I can't go over like 1.5, 1.7, 1.8. But anyway, listening to a book at 2x before you actually read it gives you some familiarity with the text itself, allows you to formulate a framework for interpretation, um, kind of preempt any questions or misunderstandings or anything like that. Like a lot of the time you can go through it and be like, what the fuck is this dude talking about when you're listening to it? So when you actually go back and read it, you know... This is where I, this is where I really need to like dig in. Um, but it also sets you up, you know, it gives you more time to ponder, more time to interpret, more time to think alongside the text itself. So I almost always listen to a book before I read it. it, it when it comes to like a, like a nonfiction, when it comes to fiction, I'll just, do whatever sometimes i listen sometimes i read sometimes i do both but when it comes to like theory philosophy um i always try to listen to it first before i read it because i can listen faster than i can read and if it's garbage it's garbage and if it's good 
it gives me more time. It sets me up to be more successful when I'm actually reading the text itself. So yeah, um, this book will be on Audible soon. Grab it up. It'll be dope. Also, go to theoryunderground.com or Amazon and order Time Energy by David McCarricker. Um, and also, order uh, Underground Theory for yourself while you're at it. And uh, eventually, it would be cool if this was also an audiobook. So we'll see. I don't know if we'll... Uh, I don't know how, how, well, I don't know if I'll be a part of it or not. I would love to be a part of it. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I got to take a break, dude. I'm delirious.